Good morning and welcome. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. We're a 501c3 nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. And this morning, we have the inaugural event of the launch of our new Africa program. And um, we will be talking about a topic that has suddenly jumped to the front pages and to the headlines in the media. And that's, of course, the situation, the evolving situation between Ethiopia and the region Tigray. And uh, this morning we have an all-star panel uh, to talk about it, folks who are deeply immersed in this topic and uh, have worked it for many years. Um, our moderator this morning is Ambassador uh, Charles G. Ray, who previously served as U.S. Ambassador to the Kingdom of Ethiopia and the Republic of Zimbabwe. Um, in addition, he was the first uh, U.S. Consul General to Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, opening our consulate there in 1988. He's a trustee of FPRI and the chair of our new Africa program. Um, he will be introducing our speakers this morning and kicking off what I no, will be a really interesting discussion. Um, but a few housekeeping um, notes before we get started. Uh, first of all, as some of you may not be familiar with this region, uh, please check out the chat window because we'll be posting uh, links to uh, at least one map, maybe more. So if you want to see this region as you listen, uh, you can pull that up. Um, we'll also be uh, uh, making a video of this presentation, so if you missed it or have to leave early or want to watch it again, we'll be sending that around to, um, to all of our uh, participants this morning, as well as you can always see it on our FPRI YouTube channel. Um, Finally, uh, we encourage you to ask questions and uh, don't put them in the chat box, put them in the Q&A box. The chat box is if, tell us if you have a technical problem or someone's not speaking loudly enough or, uh, or you want to communicate privately with us. The Q&A um, button is where to put your questions. I encourage you to start doing that right away from the beginning. And uh, so we'll have a full slate of uh, questions for our panelists to answer. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank our supporters and our board members who are with us today. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We cannot do what we do without you. And we are in this current age, a, an oasis of deep analysis and research, uh, nonpartisan. And if you value that, please consider becoming a member and supporting us. Check us out on www.fpri.org. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to present Ambassador Ray. Thank you. And it is an honor to be able to uh, launch this first event in our Africa program, uh, a very timely one, because I think that the hostilities currently between the government in Addis Ababa and their North Tigray region uh, has the potential uh, to upset the balance of power in the Horn of Africa, something that, that is uh, important to U.S. national security. Our panel today uh, includes what I think are three of the, the top people who, would, who understand this region and can put it in perspective for us. Uh, we have Ambassador David Shin, who in addition to serving as ambassador to uh, Ethiopia has extensive experience uh, throughout Africa and the world. Uh, ambassador Robert Hodak, who's also served uh, in Eritrea, uh, in Addis Ababa and in Uganda, and Professor uh, Emma uh, Boyle, who is a, uh, an expert, if I may say this, uh, she's very modest about this, uh, in conflicts, uh, especially uh, in Africa. And just one slight correction before I, before I uh, let each of our panelists briefly introduce themselves. Uh, I was ambassador to the Kingdom of Cambodia. I have been in Ethiopia once very briefly. Uh, my, service, my, my diplomatic service in Africa, in addition to being ambassador to Zimbabwe, I was the deputy chief of our mission in Sierra Leone, 1990. 
1993 to 1996. Uh, and with that, I would like to, uh, starting with Ambassador Shin, then Ambassador Hodak, and Professor Boyle, if you would like to make a few very brief remarks, uh, and then we'll get right into the questions. Ambassador Shin. Well, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I would simply like to underscore the, the seriousness and the severity of this uh, current conflict that is taking place in Ethiopia. Not only does it have uh, ramifications internally for Ethiopia, uh, which could <clears throat> upend the, um, the political stability of the country, but it conceivably has implications for the wider region, uh, particularly uh, Sudan, where you have refugee flows at the moment, uh, upwards of uh, perhaps approaching 40,000 from Ethiopia into Sudan, but also Eritrea, which uh, has a border with Tigray region. And there is a long history of some animosity between Eritrea and the Tigray region. And it looks like there may be some engagement uh, coming from Eritrea into Ethiopia today. So this is a, a really serious situation and it uh, behooves everyone, I think, to try to come to some kind of uh, de-escalation quickly and uh, some kind of uh, dialogue that hopefully can bring this f fighting to an end. Ambassador Hode? Uh, the question I had in my mind in reviewing the, all the new, recent news is, what's it all about? And uh, my immediate conclusion was for the Ethiopians, for Prime Minister Abe, it's, it's preservation of the unity of the Ethiopian state. Um, there's also an element of his going hard against the Tigrayans of, if you will, the demonstration effect. He's got problems with some of his other minorities. I'll take just, just one, left, the ONLF, the, the Agadani National Liberation Front. They've made noises about seeking a separate state. And it all gets back down to the the, the poison pill in the Constitution, Article 39, that provides for uh, a region to declare secede and declare its independence. If that is the ultimate objection objective of the Tigrayans, I'm not sure um, what they are trying to do at this point. Obviously, is try to preserve a position of power for themselves whether in a greater Ethiopia, I doubt that, or are they picking up the, the push from some Tigrayan elements to uh, declare an independent Tigrayan state? A lot of people tend to forget that when the TPLF was founded, that was one of their founding principles, was to create a Tigrayan state. And this is something that, you know, <laughs> worries our friend, the neighbors, particularly the Eritreans, because, uh, a Tigrayan state would be hard to survive being a landlocked country. And uh, I mean, there are uh, Tigrayan nationalists that have done up maps showing a, a greater Tigray uh, with expanded borders. And we have to remember that after independence in 91, the Tigrayans who were then in charge of the Ethiopian government took parts of Northwest Amhara and made it part of Tigray, which gave them a access to the Sudanese border. They also took parts of Northern Wolo, which is on the route north, uh, the key route north to Eritrea in the port of Nassau and made it part of Tigray. So I think there's uh, some fundamental concerns about what are the objections of the Tigrayans. Thank you, Professor Boyle. Hi. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you for my invitation today. Um, I'll echo Ambassador Shin's remarks on how um, this has potential uh, impacts across the region. Um, and in addition to um, what was mentioned in terms of Sudan and Eritrea, also briefly um, talk about the potential impacts on Somalia here. Um, Ethiopia has uh, been very involved in the Somalia conflict, often quite controversially. Um, but uh, the presence of Ethiopian troops 
uh, in terms of the UN peacekeeping mission, but also um, standalone troops, right, uh, outside of that peacekeeping mission, um, have often been very successful in the fight against Al Shabaab. Um, earlier in the conflict against the um, Islamic Courts Union as well. Um, the potential withdrawal of Ethiopian troops from Somalia to go and fight in the uh, current internal conflict could also destabilize um, Somalia as well. Um, and so that's something uh, to pay attention to here. The um, uh, the African Union peacekeeping um, force is due to currently um, end at the end of the year, although there are conversations ongoing uh, about uh, uh, reallocating funds to this for another year. Um, and that's, that's probably to be expected, um, but it brings a question mark over all of this. Uh, not just, like I said, for Ethiopia itself, but also for Somalia and then for the right, wider region. So what happens if the peacekeeping force does leave Somalia or if it's just fundamentally weakened by the um, exit of the Ethiopian troops? Right? It changes the power dynamics in the region. The uh, Kenyan troops in Somalia uh, will be much more powerful relative uh, to other parts of the peacekeeping force and then um, the Burundi force as well. If the peacekeeping force does fold, all these troops get sent home and there's a potential at the moment there's increasing tensions in Burundi as well uh, and if those troops are sent home, some experts believe that this could be the po uh, point that sends Burundi over the edge as well. So there's a large, uh, large regional implications here as well. Um, so thank you very much. I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you. Uh, you. You've sort of addressed actually a lot of what my first question was going to be, and that is the, the spillover effect uh, in the Horn of Africa and East Africa. But I'd, I'd like to know, is there a possibility that this conflict, if it spirals out of control, uh, could have a, an impact on, on the continent broader, out, outside of East Africa and the Horn? Is, sorry, is that for me? Um, I think that, um, I think it's probably likely to stay within the Horn, uh, or at least within East Africa. Um, I don't think it's in terms of uh, kind of a spiral of violence uh, to go much further than that. But uh, obviously, substantial destabilization in a, such a powerful country as Ethiopia can have large uh, knock-on effects. So probably not in terms of violence across the continent, but in terms of um, diplomatic relations, uh, economic relations, um, it can have significant spillover effects here. So one of the, um, uh, an example of that would be current negotiations with Sudan and, uh, and Egypt on the dam that Ethiopia is planning to build. So Ethiopia has plans uh, or is currently in the process of building an extremely large dam on the Nile and Sudan and Egypt are worried about what this means for their water flow. And obviously, uh, as we talk a lot about climate change at the moment, uh, access to water is something that uh, we're looking at in terms, of, in terms of the potential for conflict. Just over the weekend, Sudan and Ethiopia uh, held joint military exercises for the first time. And they have more joint military exercises planned uh, later this year and into next year as well. And so that is a budding alliance that is a change in the power dynamic in the region. Um, and so we can see more, um, more uh, kind of shifting power patterns uh, like that as a result of this conflict. Ambassador Shin, you looked like you had something to say there. I just have something to say. <laughs> I, I would agree that to primarily the uh, spillover effects will, will be confined to the Horn of Africa. 
but they, there will be broader issues that will go beyond the horn. For example, the Africa Union has its headquarters in Addis Ababa. The UN Economic Commission for Africa has its headquarters there. Uh, Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Africa. Whenever you have a country in turmoil that is as important as Ethiopia is, it's almost inevitable that it have some spillover effects uh, beyond the immediate region. Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid that that will be the case. If nothing else, by, by way of example, if Ethiopia should start um, disintegrating, as a, as a country, uh, I think that would have implications for the rest of the continent. And I don't rule out the possibility that you, you could have in a worst case situation, a Yugoslavia type situation in Ethiopia as a result of what is going on there. Because it's not just uh, the current conflict with, in Tigray. Uh, prior to that, there were some serious uh, ethnic differences uh, in the country that were playing out, that were creating all kinds of instability in other parts of Ethiopia. And what's happening in Tigray today could exacerbate these other problems uh, once the Tigrayan situation is dealt with, if it is dealt with. Ambassador Hodak, any comments? I agree with David. Uh, and I think I used the expression earlier on, demonstration effect. I think that's one of the things that Abi is doing is he's communicating to some of these other groups that are uh, seeking greater power or even possible uh, independence, that uh, if they make that kind of a move, he, he will be prepared to strike them down. He is going to fight for the unity of, of Ethiopia. Uh, thank you. I, I, my, my next question, it's really sort of a two-part question. Uh, one, uh, what do you think the, the West, in particular the U.S., uh, can, can do to help mediate, mitigate, or in, in this conflict. And, and the second part is, when we talk about the horn, what impact will this have on our base in Djibouti? Ambassador Shen, let's start with you on that. You know, I think the United States in isolation uh, cannot do a great deal, particularly since we're in the middle of a, of a political transition in the country. Uh, I don't see the Trump administration in a position to do a great deal in, uh, in uh, the Horn of Africa or in Africa generally. And it's going to take a while for the Biden administration to sort of get up to speed to do much. But even if you have a government that's up to speed, uh, it has to be a unified response in terms of dealing with the issues in Ethiopia. And by unified, I don't mean just uh, the North Americans and the Europeans. Uh, it, ideally, you want to bring in the Chinese and the Russians and a, a few others to, uh, to put pressure wherever it has to be brought to bear uh, at some point in the future. And without that, uh, I don't think the Ethiopians or the Tigrayans or anyone else is going to pay much attention to any outside force. They seem committed to a, a, a military solution at the moment. Uh, there's no desire to interrupt that. Calls for de-escalation are being totally ignored. The idea of dialogue is being ignored. Uh, it would take huge pressure from a unified international group to uh, bring any pressure to bear, I think, on all of the parties involved in this. As far as Djibouti, um, for the short term, I don't see any uh, threat to the, uh, the different bases that, are, that function out of Djibouti. There are about five or six of them now, or three major ones, the, the American base, the French base, and the Chinese base. Uh, the others are from Japan and the European countries are quite small. Uh, I think um, Djibouti is probably sufficiently isolated from what is happening uh, in um, Ethiopia at the moment. Uh, we'll keep it out of the fray, but uh, should this become a wider conflict, then all bets are off. Ambassador Hodak, any comments? I agree with David. I think uh, uh, Djibouti is essentially off the map at, the, at, at, this, at this point. I don't think there's any threat to any of the country's bases there at this time. Uh, Professor Boyle? Yes, I have to say I agree in general as well, especially about Djibouti. The U.S. 
this is this is not going to be a priority uh, for the US. Um, even if the parties to the conflict wanted uh, negotiations, which they're indicating very strongly at the moment that they don't. Um, so the African Union uh, offered negotiations just a couple of days ago, and uh, that was turned down uh, with a tweet saying that, that uh, the fact that negotiations were going to start was fake news, um, to use a term that we've heard a lot recently. Um, so the US is not going to put a lot of effort uh, into, it's not going to be one of the high priority uh, events for a Biden administration, right? We know that uh, the outgoing Trump administration uh, does not want to get involved in a lot of uh, overseas, uh, overseas issues. Um, but the incoming Biden administration will not uh, make this a priority either. Right? There are a lot of domestic issues that need to be dealt with first. Uh, internationally, uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, traditional relationships that the Biden administration is going to want to focus on, uh, on kind of rebuilding after the last four years as well. Uh, so there'll be a focus on um, relationships with European countries and relationships with um, countries like China as well, who obviously can't be ignored within uh, the current international uh, setting. So there'll be a lot of kind of reset for our Biden administration. Um, but as we've seen over and over, internal African conflicts are not normally high priority. Uh, the American ambassador within Ethiopia has signaled uh, that the American government are supporting uh, the Ethiopian government in this, though with words rather than uh, anything else. Um, and the Undersecretary of State for Africa has indicated similarly. Um, so I wouldn't expect uh, any high level attention uh, given to this, unless we see it spiral into a regional conflict. And then that could change the dynamics pretty quickly. But while it remains an internal conflict, uh, I would expect to see statements of support, probably some offers uh, of negotiations as well, but it won't be a high priority push here. Thank you. So now uh, let's uh, take questions from the audience. Um, before, uh, before I do, I'm going to uh, expand Robert Wallace, Bob Wallace's question uh, a little bit. He, you've already talked a lot about uh, U.S. interests, but what are the U.S. interests, if any, that are affected by this? And I'm going to expand that a little bit to say, if you were advising the incoming Biden team, foreign policy team, what would you tell them about, about this situation and what policy recommendations would you make? And uh, uh, whoever wants can make a stab at that, maybe one of our ambassadors. Bob, do you want to go first? Oh, I'm, you stole my line. I was going to say, David, you want to go first? <laughs> okay, I will uh, go first then. Uh, it's, 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 Okay, go, go, man. <laughs> From now on, I'll point to someone. <laughs> yeah, that actually, that would be that would be helpful. Um, I, I think that that U.S. interests uh, are are broad in the sense that the whole Red Sea region is is something that we need to take more seriously. Now, admittedly, Ethiopia is a landlocked country; it doesn't even border on the Red Sea. But because of the importance of Ethiopia, it clearly plays a role in Red Sea politics. The Red Sea is important because it is one of the major sea lanes uniting uh, the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. Uh, it's critical for commerce, uh, not to mention warships, uh, going between those two bodies of water. That is why you have some six uh, military bases in Djibouti today and it has become a growing area of importance. The Russians have just announced that they have authorization for a military, a naval facility, effectively a military base in Port Sudan on the Red Sea. Uh, the United Arab Emirates has a major air base uh, in Asab in Eritrea, 
which uh, according to the Tigrayans, and I'm in no position to verify this, uh, there have been drones flying out of Assab uh, that have been aimed at the uh, Tigrayans. I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but I do know the airbase is a major facility because I have visited it. Uh, you have the Saudis who are ramping up on their side of the Red Sea uh, ports in order to export oil from Saudi Arabia in order to be a substitute for the Persian Gulf, if that is necessary at some point in time. So this is becoming a very critical area from a geopolitical point of view, which admittedly is of more interest to the uh, Europeans and the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Indians because of their commerce. But it's also of interest to the United States because of military traffic uh, through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal and the Strait of Bab el Mandeb. Uh, and Ethiopia plays into that. And if you have instability uh, or a total disruption of uh, authority in Ethiopia, you're going to have a problem throughout this entire region. Uh, certainly on the, um, the African side of the rest Red Sea, and things are not very good in Yemen either. So they've got plenty of problems on that side. Ambassador Hudek? I'd, I'd add to the list of countries that have outside interests is, is Israel. They're, you know, it goes back decades. They're concerned that the Red Sea become an Arab lake. Uh, there are still concerns of, of uh, failing, if you will, failing states in the Horn of Africa being more susceptible to Islamic uh, fundamentalism. Um, but to get back to the, the question of uh, your earlier question about the U.S. role, uh, our standing is not good in the area. I mean, the and a lot of this goes back to the transition in 1991, where uh, we were very strongly supportive of the TPLF, mainly through the persona of Mela Sanawi, who was a remarkable leader. And one who I think, like Abi, aspired to be and wanted to be truly an Ethiopian national leader to build a, a, strong, a strong Ethiopia. What have we done with Ethiopia? One of the most important things on, on their agenda right now is the great, the great Renaissance Dam. And uh, what did our president have to say about that in terms of what the Egyptians might do? I mean, our so-called mediation, I, I don't believe it actually ever took place. We have tended to side with the Egyptians. When it, when it comes to the Horn, or particularly with Ethiopia, uh, Egypt has always sort of played the big trump card because it's that big and most important of Arab countries and key to continuing peace with Israel. So that whole Arab-Israeli thing plays into the horn. Uh, the Eritreans are convinced that, you know, I, again, because we sided with Melis Sinawi, that uh, we are out to disrupt them. The Amharas feel the same way and that, that it is uh, uh, America and the CIA that are supporting the TPLF. All kinds of crazy things. If there's one area of the world where you start going out there and Googling and looking at all the different sites, I think this is the one area where there is more disinformation, misinformation, and conspiracy theories thrown out. And quite frankly, it's very difficult, particularly with the close down of, uh, of email, uh, uh, internet uh, connections, and the keep, uh, keeping of Western journalists out, there's not a lot of good and reliable information that is emanating from the region. Uh, thank you. Well, we have a question, and we now have 27 questions, by the way. Um, uh, Scotty Scottsko, who I think some of you know well, uh, has asked about, is there a possibility of outside actors becoming involved to exploit the situation? I would say, who would that be and how would they exploit it? Uh, let's start with Professor Boyle. Sorry. Uh, hi. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah, we, there is the potential for outside actors to become involved here. Um, we're seeing uh, Eritrea being dragged into this pretty quickly. Um, and can that be used to, um, to kind of get uh, 
get them an advantage on the border dispute that's been going on. Um, so that could be uh, that could be one issue here in terms of uh, Somalia, where right? you have other issues there, um, and you still have um, ethnic Somalis within uh, Ethiopia as well, along the southern border of Ethiopia. Um, could that be uh, could that be an issue here? What I wouldn't expect uh, necessarily um, a kind of uh, complete collapse, right, or secession of some of these regions, um, but could actors exploit this? Certainly. Right? And we've seen some of that in recent years um, as well. So we've seen a rise in attacks against uh, different ethnic groups within Ethiopia. Uh, and there are a number of different, um, uh, different ideas about who is causing those attacks, um, but the, uh, the impression seems to be that those attacks against the different ethnic groups are designed to sow division within the country. Uh, and that, in a situation like this, where there's open conflict, is only likely to get worse. When you have ethnic groups that span these borders, that brings those other countries into these conflicts. Um, so as we see kind of internal disputes, maybe attacks against ethnic Somalis, then uh, we should expect that to spill over into, uh, into Somalia as well, but also uh, the Somalia dynamics to spill over into Ethiopia. Uh, so there'll be a lot, of, um, a lot of tensions within the regions uh, and with the borders uh, being a little bit more porous than maybe uh, we're used to, uh, then there's a lot of potential here that some of this maybe kind of lower level violence uh, will become much more widespread. Thanks. Ambassador Shin, do you have an observation on that? Yeah, a couple of other points I would make. I've already alluded to one of them, and that is if the uh, allegations are true that drones are, are flying out of the uh, United Arab Emirates base in Eritrea into Tigray, then they're obviously the UAE is, uh, is engaged. Uh, if that's accurate. Uh, you also have Gulf state money flowing into the region. And the question is, who are they supporting with that money? Uh, that money could become very important in terms of uh, even winning a military victory one way or the other. Another candidate for potential engagement would be Egypt. Uh, it would be in Egypt's interest to keep this thing as stirred up as possible so that they could have an advantage in, in interacting with Ethiopia on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Blue Nile River, where they have a, a major dispute with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, Ethiopia. So, you know, I would watch carefully what Egypt does in this dispute. Uh, we have a question from Joe Keel, who says, tell us more about Eritrea's Isaias what, and what he hopes to gain from this affair. But I would actually broaden that question. Uh, which is uh, Prime Minister Abbey. Uh, what, what is his motivation in all of this? And what's the impact of his legacy? Um, and expand that to the other uh, important you know, leaders in the region. What do they hope to get out of this? And, um, and maybe beyond that a little bit, uh, how could a US foreign policy work with these leaders and appeal to them in a, in a way to resolve the situation. Ambassador Hodeck, that's a big question. I'm, I'll hand it to you. Well, I'll go back to my fundamental thesis that obvious number one concern is the preservation of Ethiopian national unity to forge a, a strong Ethiopia that incorporates the various eth ethnic groups where they start thinking that they're Ethiopians first and not Tigrayans or, or Romos or, or uh, Agadenis. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with David. I mean, the, the number one country in terms of external power having it, in any interest in what's going on are the Egyptians. I don't know that the Egyptians have come to any conclusions yet about what policy to pursue. Uh, I think that there's probably a default, anything that keeps uh, the situation muddled, confused, keeps Ethiopia, Tigray in general, weakened is, is to its advantage. 
Uh, to pick up on the thing out of the UAE, uh, drones out of the UAE, uh, I mean, I've seen some of those uh, internet uh, things, and surely they're capable of flying all the way to T-graders, shoot a few rockets. But, you know, the, Ethiop the Ethiopians don't need that kind of support. T-Gray has no air force. The Ethiopians pulled all of their aircraft that were based in T-Gray out. They've got over two dozen Su-27s, more than two uh, dozen uh, MiG-23s, uh, uh, a number of helicopter gunships. They command the air. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think one of the reasons that the TPLF has sent rockets at uh, the air bases at Baradar, Gond and Gondar, uh, and out of Humera, is that they're worried about uh, possibly uh, Ethiopians doing some forward basing for air operations. Um, Professor Boyle, anything to add to that? Yeah, so I would say in terms of what um, Eritrea says it wants to gain from this, um, my interpretation would be probably um, to kind of increase his power vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ethiopia, right? Ethiopia is this powerhouse within the region. Uh, Eritrea, a uh, much weaker state. He can kind of use this um, to maybe try and uh, build up those power dynamics uh, a little bit more against uh, Ethiopia. And then in terms of what uh, Abi is uh, aiming for here, I think that um, he certainly came to power arguing that it was going to be uh, Ethiopia for the national interest, uh, for all of the um, ethnic groups rather than uh, the Tigray, which had traditionally been in power for a long time in Ethiopia. Um, what we've seen since this conflict has started is a kind of purge of a lot of um, the Tigray who had traditionally been in uh, in positions of power, right? And so that even goes for military personnel who are currently serving within Somalia. Uh, the Tigray uh, who are within the African Union mission uh, have been told to stand down. Some of them have been brought back to Ethiopia. And so the power dynamics within Ethiopia is about this kind of resetting of ethnic uh, power as well. Uh, in a way that um, could be argued that it's kind of resetting uh, and correcting for what had happened before, uh, but it depends how far this goes, right? And there are arguments about whether we've hit the point of uh, genocide against the Tigrans, um, which would obviously go far beyond resetting previous power dynamics. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of those accusations, the UN uh, just earlier uh, within the last 24 hours has said they expect that Sudan will host about 200,000 refugees uh, within the next few weeks coming from the Tigray region. So that, uh, that again has a huge impact on uh, Sudan uh, and regional dynamics here, um, but also points to the levels of violence that are taking place within the Tigray region. Uh, and um, we don't have a lot of information coming out of that region because the reporters aren't allowed in. Uh, so we take other signals of, uh, of just how strong the violence, uh, the levels of violence are there. Um, thank, thank you, Professor Boyle. We have a, a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, uh, do you think international in institutions such as the UN and the AU, the African Union, are doing enough to intervene? If not, what are actionable recommendations you have for this intervention? And I would ask and add another angle to that is, uh, what would be the impact of the US getting more involved with those uh, international institutions if, if we're not supporting them or providing whatever support might needed, or will they be hampered in doing anything? Uh, let's go to Ambassador Shin for that. I think the only way that the U.S. could conceivably get involved at this juncture, um, even putting aside the problems of a political transition in our own country at the moment, 
would be through the UN Security Council. And anything short of that would accomplish, in my view, almost nothing. Uh, and even in the Security Council, you have the problem that would, would you even get agreement from China and Russia in terms of anything that you proposed? And I'm not sure that you would. Uh, it might require a fairly serious sanctions program, for example. Uh, China and Russia traditionally will not support sanctions, so that, that may, uh, may not work. Um, I, I don't think at this point that the uh, African Union is in a strong position to deal with this. It can certainly use its hortatory power to urge de-escalation, et cetera, but because of the the actors that are involved here, I'm not sure they'd have much impact one way or the other. Normally, I would like to see the African Union step in. I'm not sure this is the right one to, uh, to try to grapple with. Ambassador Hudak, anything to add to that? Yeah, the, you know, uh, these institutions, particularly the African Union, uh, Museveni out of Uganda, they've tried to play a mediating role, essentially, uh, essentially, very firmly, the uh, Ethiopian government obviously has said, push off. There ain't any room for mediation. We're going to see this thing through. Now, the question in my mind is, um, does Abi think, I, th I suspect he does think, that he can separate the TPLF top leadership from the Tigrayan people? That he can convince the Tigrayan people that, you know, that their future is as part of a larger Ethiopia that they will not be discriminated against. And uh, I think that, that was sort of implicit in his 72 hours, uh, the dictum saying, you know, I'm giving you 72 hours to surrender and, and the civilian population out of McKelly, then the siege is coming. We have to remember that there is so much, much mistrust on both sides. Uh, the Degrayans have been looked down upon by so many of the other minorities, particularly the Amhara, who considered them peasants and uh, charwomen in their homes. Uh, I'll never forget when uh, the, the TPLF forces took uh, Addis Ababa. Within 24 hours, there were street demonstrations in front of our embassy that le led a number of people being killed by the TPLF people that were providing our, us, us protection. And they were screaming and shouting, we will never be ruled by uh, uh, Tigrayan peasants. Uh, strong stuff, strong stuff. Now, the other side of the coin is, I don't think, you know, everybody says the Eritreans have this profound hatred of the Tigrayans. No, in many ways, you know, they were the ones in the early days that made the TPLF what it was. Are they angered by what the TPLF did once it came to power in Ethiopia in terms of Bottome and that? Yeah. But most Eritreans are Tigrinya speakers. Their origins, they, if there's one part of Ethiopia that they have closer ties to, it's Tigray. Is there any truth, though, to uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, allegations that uh, the, the, you know, the, some of the measures he took were to crack down on Tigrayan corruption, that that was a problem. Uh, but was that any worse among the Tigrayans uh, than it was among other groups in Ethiopia, or was it just because the Tigrayans ran the show for so long? Uh, uh, I'll defer to David on that because okay. he... Yeah, I, I think that that's more of a ruse than anything else. I mean, let's face it, there's corruption uh, throughout Ethiopia to one extent or another. I think that's more of a, of a reflection of um, wider Ethiopian concern about the economic power of the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front and the organizations it has controlled over the years. And I, I think uh, Abi uh, Ahmed is probably calling that corruption, which is not exactly the way I would define it, but it, it certainly is of concern to others. I just want to underscore one point that Bob made, which is really critical in terms of the next week or so, as far as how this plays out. And, and that is the degree to which the Tigrayan people support the TPLF or not. And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there were elections in, um, in Tigray in October, the TPLF won overwhelming support in those elections. But does that mean that the Tigrayan people are with the TPLF until the bitter end? 
I don't know. If they are, then I predict a very, very messy outcome to all of this. If they are not, then this thing could wrap up sooner than I would have thought otherwise. But this is a critical question. And those of us sitting in places like Washington just don't know the answer to the question. Uh, what about the role of China? I mean, China has built roll, road projects in Ethiopia and in the region. Are they in a position, so they can't be happy about this, I'm guessing. Are they in a position to exert any influence? Um, I don't know who's best to answer that. Maybe raise your hand if you have an idea. Um, uh, uh, Ambassador Shen. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on, on China, Africa. Um, the Chinese are in a position to play a role. They have an enormous amount of, uh, of economic influence in the country, but I, they, are, they will be very reluctant to take sides in this. Uh, they have traditionally had a good relationship with the former uh, EPRDF, the uh, Ethiopian People's uh, uh, Revolutionary Democratic uh, Front, and they've had a good relationship with the TPLF. They have tried to establish a good relationship with Abiy Ahmed and the Prosperity Party. Uh, they don't want to get in the middle of, of a fracas where they don't know what the outcome is going to be. So while they have the potential for influence, I think they will be very reluctant to use it. Yeah. A question from um, Amit Padia. Uh, what is the military balance of forces between Ethiopia uh, and Tigrayan forces that might determine the outcomes, or I would add the, le you know, the length of the... Um, the, the hostilities, uh, you know, if, if they're equal, it's going to go on longer. Um, I don't know who's best to answer that. Um, let's try Professor Boyle. Um. So um, I, I think uh, Bob has more information on, uh, on the um, uh, forces themselves, but I know over the last few days, um, the Ethiopian army was able to uh, get its initial gains as quickly as it did, uh, in part because of the element of surprise and in part because of the geography of the region. Where the fighting is taking place now in the western region, um, the, uh, the geography very much favours uh, the Tigrayan forces. Uh, and that is an area where they can uh, dig in um, and that's why we're expecting that the, um, that the fighting from here on out, or at least uh, over the next week or so, uh, will, be, uh, will be pretty brutal, uh, but also will be more evenly matched because it's less at this point in time to do with um, maybe military equipment and more to do with um, where the forces themselves are, are found and what kind of terrain they're fighting on. I, I, yeah, I, I would just add that the central government uh, clearly mm -hmm. has more firepower than the Tigrayan forces do, although the, the Tigrayans did capture the Northern Command, which is located in Mekele, and all of the armament that was there, and that's one of the factors that started this whole thing off. Uh, so they do have a lot of equipment. Uh, the Ethiopian central government controls the air, as Bob pointed out. That's an important factor. Uh, the other issue is that the, uh, the Ethiopian central government forces are, are trained military, trained army and air force, whereas most of what you have in Tigray are militia forces. There are a lot of them, and their numbers may not be significantly below what you have in the uh, Ethiopian central government uh, armed forces, but they're, they're militia and they're not going to be trained to the same extent that you, uh, you find in the central government. Uh, thank you. Master Hodick. Uh, I'll take exception to, to what Emma said about the, uh, the West being uh, better territory for the uh, Tigrayans to, uh, to fight in. I mean, it's more flat land and the, uh, the Ethiopians have the armor. It's more Tanks are much more effective there than in the mountainous regions. Uh, David made a good point. Um, the Ethiopian army is a well-trained, probably one of the better, better armies in all of Africa. Definitely one of the better air forces. Uh, they've got the equipment. But, you know, the Ethiopian army uh, was drawn down considerably 
uh, and there are only about 140,000 people in it. Whereas the Tigrayans have over 250,000, but as David pointed out, the vast majority of these people are militias. Now, if the government, uh, Ethiopian government does take Michele, because the TPLF evacuates and goes to the hills, 250,000 militia who are native to the land could put up one hell of a guerrilla campaign that would really tie down the Ethiopians. And that could send messages to other minorities within Ethiopia. I mean, in terms of stretching the mili military, and prove that they too might be able to uh, conduct uh, unconventional warfare against the central government. Uh, Ambassador Hodeck, are you thinking in terms, when you say guerrilla warfare, are you thinking in terms of bringing the fight right to Addis Ababa through sort no, of- No, 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 okay. no. Just, just basically tying down the Ethiopian government uh, in sort of an end, endless conflict, playing out for, you know, they can find out I mean, this is the problem is they're going to have to find some external sources of support. They're landlocked. The Sudanese government is seemingly, well, I think uh, more than neutral. I think, I think the Ethiopians have, have, have that fairly well under control. The Eritreans aren't friendly. Their southern border is, is Ethiopia. Food, fuel, rearmament, where is it going to come from? And with the Ethiopians controlling the airspace, there aren't going to be too many planes flying in to whatever airfield that the, uh, the, uh, the Tigrayans uh, uh, maintain. Yeah. T take, taking air, uh, Tigray is one thing. Holding it, as Bob suggests, is quite another. And there you get back to the question is, what is the, what is the commitment and the loyalty of the Tigrayan people, who are the militia after all? Uh, are they going to fully support the TPLF or not? And I don't know the answer to that question, but it's absolutely critical in terms of how this plays out. Um, thank you. We have a question from Bob Kaplan um, uh, about uh, Prime Minister Abi Ahmed uh, at peace his recent peace deal with Eritrea, for which he won the Nobel Prize, uh, may have been an early attempt to pressure Tigray or he says, might it have been an early attempt to pressure Tigray from both the North and the South? And Bob, as a comment, says, when I was a reporter in the Horn in the 1980s, there was a similarity with the current crisis, the violent tensions to which the ethnically complex empire of Ethiopia is prone. Um, Ambassador Hodek. What, what, is, the, what is the question? It's my Prime Minister Ahmed's peace deal with Eritrea uh, have been an early attempt to pressure Tigray from both the North and the South. Oh. I, I just don't know the answer to that one. It sounds, sounds too Machiavellian for me. I, I don't know the answer either. Yeah. Uh, Professor Boyle? Uh, no, I, I have no insight uh, into that at all. Uh, but I generally, um, generally, I think the answers are normally the simplest explanation. Um, and I don't think often that, uh, that the long term strategies that sometimes can appear uh, to be there are often there. But that's a general comment, not a specific one to this issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, it sounds like an area for further research. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee who um, notes, as, as some of you earlier noted, that there's a lot of fake news and propaganda, and I would add conspiracies circling around the Ethiopian internet, and I would say it's beyond Ethi Ethiopia, beyond that, and fueling conflict. How can this be mitigated while keeping freedom of the media and press? Who I think there's, an e there's an easy answer to that one. It can't be. Look at our own election and all of the exactly. nonsense that we've had in the United States. If we can't deal with it, how can we expect uh, the Ethiopian diaspora or others to deal with it? It's totally out of control. 
Um, getting back to um, uh, here, this is the shut off of the telecommunications in the Tigray region. There's an information blackout. We are mostly hearing the side of the Ethiopian federal government and the attendee asked, doesn't this raise red flags? Short mm -hmm. answer is yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. And I, I think that goes back to the, uh, your other question as well about the fake news and propaganda because that is uh, a really ripe breeding ground uh, for fake news to flourish and we've seen, uh, as Ambassador Shin said, in the, uh, in the domestic situation where we have the press um, reporting how easy it is for conspiracies uh, to spread. Uh, where in areas where you have media blackout, uh, it is natural for people to speculate. And even without meaning to, conspiracy theories can start in that kind of situation. And then as we're seeing uh, recently, uh, there's also the deliberate conspiracy theories as well, which are designed to sow, um, sow dissent and to sow division as well. So when you've got a media blackout, you get you get both of those, right? The accidental conspiracies, but also the deliberate conspiracies, and that makes it even more difficult uh, to deal with. Um, I'm going to ask. I'm going to pair two final questions because, and we still have 30 questions unanswered. Uh, one from Dave asks, uh, "Where does the Ethiopia situation rank among other African issues, such as Great Lakes stability and struggles with extremists in the Sahel, for instance?" And Adrian Bazora, um, Ambassador Adrian Bazora, who is one of our trustees, asks, "How did the Tigrayans become so powerful in earlier regimes, given that they?" are only less than 5% of the population and Amharic is the primary language. So they're sort of two different questions, but I'm going to package them together. Um, Ambassador Hodek, would you like to take a stab at that? Yeah, the Tigrayans were, were not that strong of a rebel movement. It was only in the, in the last uh, sort of 18 months of the Civil War after a, a bat, major battle at Shire that they captured a, a, a great deal of heavy equipment, tanks, artillery. Eritreans came in and trained them up on that. They, quote, led the, uh, the strike force that took Addis Ababa. Actually, it was uh, led by an Eritrean armored brigade, but the Tigrayans were out in front on them. They took over the government and uh, they were very, very fortunate in having uh, Melis Zanawi as a leader, a very adept individual that I think ha had a larger vision uh, of trying to uh, uh, lead, lead an Ethiopian nation. And there was a lot of deft diplomacy on his part with dealing with outside players and, and others. And uh, he played a good game. Uh, and I don't want to say it was, it was a game that he was trying to deceive. He played his cards well, but I think that the turning point for the TPLF in terms of the downturn was 2005, when that election proved that the EPRDF was essentially a sham, that, that the Tigrayans were held in, uh, were hated by so many of the other uh, Ethiopian ethnic groups, particularly the Amhara. The animus between those two groups is, is profound, absolutely profound. But uh, no, I, I give a lot of the, the credit for the success of the TPLF to the persona of Nella Sanawi. Mm -hmm. and, and where does this rank, uh, the situation in terms of other issues? Oh, it's, it's, it's important. Again, second largest country in Africa, country that has some resources, important geography vis-a-vis the Red Sea and, and, and the larger Middle East. I mean, the Sahel is, you know, a bunch of people uh, chasing folks up in a in northern desert. Is, is it a profound uh, uh, threat to American interests, a threat to the homeland? Hell no. But, you know, bad things, some serious bad things could happen vis-a-vis -vis Ethiopia, 
which again, as we were talking earlier, <laughs> has the Egyptians concerned, has the, the, the people in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula concerned, the Israelis concerned. No, that's, it's the big issue. I, I, would, I would just add very quickly that uh, in terms of ranking, I put it in the top two anyway, to, right now in Africa, in terms of uh, concerns that we should be looking at. As, as far as uh, Tigray is concerned, I would just add that um, the Tigrayans actually are 6% of the population, slightly larger than what was suggested uh, in the question itself. But more importantly, the Tigrayans have also, beyond what Bob already said, uh, have developed a very uh, strong uh, economic organizations, basically state-owned companies that have been very profitable going back to starting in 1991. And they have been able to maintain those even as they have uh, developed uh, the additional autonomy in Tigray. So that provides uh, an income stream that has been very important. And the Tigrayans have been relatively united as an ethnic group, at least up till now. We'll see what happens from this point forward. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Ambassador Ray um, to make some remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just like to to point out that that the FBI's Africa program's goal uh, is to inform and educate policymakers, business executives, opinion leaders, and the public here in the United States about the diversity and complexity of the African continent. Uh, and and I think uh, as as has been brought out in this this presentation, uh, it is a very complex. Uh, continent. It is not the 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 single this entity that that I think many Americans see Africa either as a basket of uh, famine, crisis, and and violence, uh, or as a, a homeland, a fatherland, motherland. But it, it's a very complex place with a, with a lot of issues that have the potential to impact on on our security and on our economy, uh, albeit in, in relatively small ways compared to others. Uh, and, and I think that today has been a, an outstanding uh, beginning for this program. And uh, I'd like to point out, as, as Raleigh said at the beginning and has mentioned several times in the comments, uh, programs like this can only exist with, with the support of people uh, like those of you who are attending today, and we definitely solicit your support so that we can make this an even better uh, contribution to FBRI's greater mission. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to our panelists for giving us uh, the benefit of their wisdom. Uh, it's been most enlightening. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to all of you as well, um, Ambassador Ray and our distinguished panelists. This was a great discussion. And uh, with 33 still unanswered questions, I think we have fodder for plenty of future programs. So thank you. And uh, we, we will be back. Take care. Stay safe and happy Thanksgiving to all of you. <laughs>